Hello and welcome. This is Sabrina Paganoni. I'm here for our weekly Healy ALS platform trial updates. And I'm giving everyone a few seconds. I see that um, the audience is joining from the waiting room. So thank you for joining us. And we can go to the next slide, which is the most important slide of the day, uh, because today I'm really honored to have uh, Bruce Rosenblum um, as our guest speaker today. He's joining our patient navigation team with Alison and Catherine, and I know we've all been uh, working together for, for a long time, and, and Bruce is um, really a valued member of our uh, committees and many of our projects, um, and, and really today, He'll, he'll speak with, with us about, um, you know, like uh, his involvement with, with the trial and our EAP programs. But without further ado, Bruce, please take it away. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And I actually want to start off slightly off topic, uh, Dr. Paganoni. I want to offer you and everyone at the Healy Center a huge congratulations. The news that came out of Canada on Monday that Amalex's uh, Albioza, as they're calling it, has received a conditional approval there. Um, obviously, we'd love to hear the same from the FDA, but every little step forward in the right direction counts. And you know that there's a huge amount of hard work and effort that went in from the research team, huge amount of dedication from all of the patients and their caregivers and their families. And um, it, it's just a tremendous milestone. And you know, for you, I, I got to imagine you were dancing on air on Monday because how many researchers in their entire career get even a single medication through even, you know, one approval for patients. So congratulations to you on that. And that's sort of a jumping off point for where I want to go today uh, because, uh, you know, all of this comes about all of these clinical trials and EAP opportunities and so on from an awful lot of hard work. And we still have a lot more work to do. Uh, Albriosa is just one example of a success story in a disease that is littered with uh, unfortunately stories that were not successful. And what I wanna do is just briefly share my own perspective as a patient who's been involved in a clinical trial and in EAP over the last four years. So I was diagnosed with ALS in August of 2017. Uh, I first reported problems with random falls to my primary care physician a couple of months earlier in June 2017. Uh, he immediately figured out there was something neurological going on, uh, had a lumbar MRI ordered, came back negative. And then the next step, fortunately for me, is my primary care ordered an EMG. I didn't actually go to a neurologist for that. And when the results came in from that, he got concerned. Fortunately for me, didn't show it. He said, you know, let's get a few more tests. And I think it's time for you to see a neurologist. So very calm about the whole thing. Um, I was, again, incredibly fortunate. You know, people may say, how can you say you're fortunate with a diagnosis like ALS? Well, I try to focus on the positives in life around me. And I was incredibly fortunate that my diagnosis was delivered by an ALS specialist who proceeded to spend an hour and a half with my wife and myself, very compassionately answering every question that we had. And a week later, I was seen at MGH, Massachusetts General Hospital, for a second opinion. And during that visit, in which I was able to actually absorb a bit more information, because it wasn't the absolute shock of you have ALS uh, being thrown at me. Uh, I met not only with the neurologist, but several other people on the team, including a research access nurse, Judy Carey, who some of you may have talked with over the years. And that was the point where I began to learn about clinical trials. And in fact, one of the trials that she did talk with me about that day was the Centaur trial. Turned out I didn't qualify for that. But there was another phase three trial going on at the time. It was just starting up that sounded really, really exciting. It may have had three spinal taps, actually seven altogether, but it still sounded really exciting. It sounded really promising. And uh, so I expressed interest in that. And uh, four months later, was pre-screened for it. And after a lead-in period of three months, I was accepted into that. And at that moment, the hope that I got 
of simply being accepted into a clinical trial was tremendous. Because I'd first of all made the decision that I wasn't going to sit back in the face of this diagnosis and do nothing. I wanted to do everything I possibly could for myself. And I'll be very honest with you, this was all about me at the beginning. What can I do to try to extend my life? This was nothing about the sciences. It was nothing about what's good for other patients. This was honestly about me. And it gave me a huge amount of hope, even though I knew there was a 50-50 risk of getting a placebo because it was better than doing nothing. So I went through that trial. It was 11 months. And an interesting th thing happened about halfway through that trial. I came in one day for a routine check and I was having a bad day and I don't even, I don't even remember why, but the neurologist I was working with immediately sensed that. She set aside her stack of papers and she said, Bruce, what's going on? And she just listened to me for 20 or 25 minutes. And then she finally said, you know, Bruce, we got to get through these papers. we got to do the exam. And we finished that. And I went on my way. And as I was walking out of the hospital, I thought, you know what? In a world of 15-minute managed care appointments, how in the world did I just get a therapy session from an incredibly busy neurologist? And at that moment, I realized I was working with a team of incredibly caring and compassionate people. And that this was no longer about me. This was about the larger clinical trial. This was about trying to figure out what's going to solve ALS, what's going to work for patients, and honestly, the privilege of working with an amazing team of people. So when I got to my second to last visit, I turned to that same neurologist and said, hey, you know, these last 11 months, they've been an amazing journey for me. I've learned so much. I've worked with some amazing people. I want to stay involved in research because it's the right thing for me to do. If there's anything that you can learn with my body, whether it's observational studies, whether it's tapping my blood or my skin or my cerebral spinal fluid, all of which have been tapped for biomarkers, or anything I can do to help you figure this out so that we can help other patients, I'm all in. I will put aside everything else I'm doing to make sure that this is how I focus my time. And so I ended up during 2019 becoming involved in numerous other studies. And we kept our eyes open for clinical trials that might work for me. And unfortunately, for every single one, it turned out there was some sort of a barrier. There was some sort of an exclusion. And by April 2020, I thought, you know, maybe the platform trial, which was just starting up, is going to be my best option because it looked like it didn't have the exclusions that I was going to face from other trials. But it did have one critical exclusion, which most trials have, which is once you're three years past symptom onset, most trials you're not eligible for. And I was crushed. Six weeks later, I got a call from Judy Carey, uh, who said, hey, Bruce, we've got uh, a trial going on with IC14. Are you interested? I said, yeah, but I thought I wasn't eligible for any trials. She goes, well, actually, this is an expanded access program in EAP. So we don't have any exclusion requirements. And the way EAPs work is you get the drug. Uh, for those of you not familiar with EAPs, sometimes the term compassionate use is used for them as well. It's basically we have no other options for you. If you are willing to put something experimental into your body, we're willing to let you try it. And so I eagerly signed up for this. And I've been going into MGH every two weeks for the last two years to get an infusion. And I've been tremendously lucky in all of this because I've had access. I happen to live two and a half miles from MGH. Um, I've had the opportunities. But what really drives me forward now from a patient perspective is how do we get these opportunities in front of other patients? How do we have enough clinical trial slots so interested patients can get access to them within their geographical constraints? Not everyone lives two and a half miles from MGH the way I do. And correspondingly, how do we, once we have all those slots, whether it's clinical trials, whether it's EAPs, how do we make sure that patients learn about that? 
How do we make sure that urologists who may not be ALS specialists learn enough information to present this to patients? And so I was invited today to speak in my role as a member of the platform trial uh, EAP advisory panel. And part of why I'm excited to be on that panel is because it's about finding ways to expand the number of EAPs possible, making sure that as much as possible, every company that participates in the platform trial is aware that patients want EAPs, they need these opportunities, and correspondingly, making sure that the clinical teams that patients are working with know that there may not be just clinical trials, but there may also be EAP opportunities for patients. So it's a two-parter in terms of making sure the slots are available, making sure that the patients, their caregivers, and their families hear about them. And ultimately, uh, and I'll close on this note, and then we can open it up for questions if there are any, ultimately what drives me, and this is what's driven me since I was fortunate to have a counseling session four years ago in the middle of a clinical trial visit, every minute of my time that I can donate, give, or whatever word you want to use, towards helping researchers try to figure out what is ALS, what causes it, how we can slow it, how we can cure it. It's worth every minute of my time, not necessarily that it may help me, but if we can manage somehow or another to solve this even one day sooner, so even one patient and that patient's family doesn't have to go through what I'm going through, it's worth every minute of my time. And that's my primary focus with whatever time I may have left. So that's my story in a nutshell. Those are my thoughts and thank you very much. Thank you so much. I mean, really, um, the only say I, I see a comment here in the chat says, Bruce, you are an inspiration. And I, I don't know what else to say. That's really true. Uh, thank you so much for being here and sharing your story. We are receiving a number of questions. I know Alison has received a few. Uh, Alison, would you mind asking some of the questions that you received for Bruce? Sure, happy to. Um, Bruce, first question. What would you tell other patients who are considering um, trying to determine if they would like to participate in research? What should they consider? Um, they should consider a number of things. One is, um, first of all, geographically, can they make it work? Um, is it something they can do remotely? Is it something where they have convenient access to the hospital? Uh, there are some trials, for example, one that Dr. Bedlack's doing right now, which is an all remote trial for a pill that you take twice a day. Uh, that's relatively easy. Other trials that are more invasive may involve spinal taps. You may need to be closer to a hospital. So that's one consideration. Um, another consideration is if it's a clinical trial, are you willing to take the risk that it may be a placebo? And I know there's a lot of controversy about placebos, um, they are necessary. It is part of the scientific process. In my case, as I said earlier, the uh, concept of I might get placebo, but trying to do something is better than doing nothing. Absolutely, it wasn't even a question for me. I was willing to take that risk. So those are a couple of considerations. Um, you know, I think, again, for me, the core one from an emotional perspective is being involved has given me hope. And that has been, that's a large part of why I'm still going five years after diagnosis. Exactly. And just, I know, Bruce, we've had some conversations and I know in the community, we help each other along and we're all here in a somewhat informal way to be able to reach out to each other to make those decisions. So mm -hmm. I, I know you've helped other people as well. I'm sure you're open to that. Absolutely. I'm very open to that. Certainly through the uh, through Allison and Catherine, people can connect with me. Perfect. Have you ever experienced a challenge when participating in research? And if so, how did you overcome that? I can't think of a specific challenge I've faced. And I think part of that is because uh, the informed consent process went very well with me. I think you probably had other webinars about that whole process and how it works. 
Um, and the team at MGH has just been incredibly supportive. Honestly, I think, you know, as I reflect on it, the biggest challenge for me was uh, first and foremost, the disappointment when I didn't qualify for additional clinical trials after my first one. And I think maybe the second disappointment was when we finally got the top line results on my first clinical trial, the one that I was in four years ago. They unfortunately did not meet either their primary or secondary objective. And so there can be that disappointment that you put all this time and energy and invest in it emotionally, and it still may not be something that is uh, going to prove out scientifically in terms of then being able to go on to the next stage or go to the FDA. Uh, so there is that risk as well. Okay, I have a long question for you, so bear with me as I read this. Um, Kim and it says, thanks so much for sharing, Bruce. Do you know how families or caregivers can get involved in EAP advocacy if their loved one isn't currently connected to a clinical trial site since they don't qualify for any trials? Do you know of any state or national orbs or efforts on this front that folks can join? Um, in some ways, I feel more comfortable kicking that back to you, Allison, and to Catherine, because I know the two of you are much more up to date on what's available and can often uh, point patients in the right direction for where there may be opportunities to take in, that they can take advantage of. Uh, the other thing is Dr. Bedlack, who I believe has spoken on this uh, uh, weekly webinar before, has just finished writing a chapter about how EAPs can be constructed so that individual doctors can actually set them up working with their patients. And it does take some effort. It's not something where it's 15 minutes of work and you can set up an EAP, but there is now much more information out there about how a doctor can set them up. So I believe that chapter is available. Is that through the Neil site, Allison? Um, so maybe you can pop a link into the chat for this. Um, that's something that patients can bring to their clinician, their neurologist and say, hey, uh, you know, this can be done. Are there opportunities where we can set something up for me? Good advice to talk to your neurologist. That's definitely a great contact yep. for that. And um, Dr. Pagnoni, I see a few questions coming in. I wanna maybe direct to you just in general questions about if you're in an EAP, can you continue to take different supplements and such? That's a great question. Um, so for, for most EAPs, and obviously it depends on the specific program, but I would say that for most EAPs, there are very limited, if no limitations, in terms of um, general supplements that one can take. Obviously, it's possible that a specific EAP drug may have some safety interactions with some specific supplement, and, and in that case, it will be prohibited, but for the most part, they're not. Now, they may not allow people to be on additional experimental medications. So general supplements may be fine. Other experimental medications may not be fine, again, because of the possibility of interaction. So for EAPs, I would say that, again, most supplements will be okay, but experimental drugs may not. Um, Dr. Paganoni, is it also possible for people to be involved in more than one EAP at a time? So that's, a, that's another great question. So for most EAPs, that is not possible. Um, now, that there may have been very rare exceptions. I would say that for the most part, uh, it's best to do one at a time. So either one clinical trial at a time for people who are eligible or one EAP at a time uh, for people who are not eligible for clinical trials. And that's for a number of reasons, including interactions between drugs uh, as well as safety concerns. I think that's all the questions we have come in specifically for EAPs. Dr. Pagnone, if you want to take over for the healing stuff. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I can, um, you know, uh, give a, a very short update tonight. Again, we're so happy to have Bruce with us tonight. Uh, but maybe if we can share the slides, uh, as is our tradition, we, we love to, to provide some updates on the numbers and, and, and what's going on in, in the platform trial. So we are, uh, as you know, working hard to complete the analysis of the first four regimens while we're also enrolling new participants in the fifth regimen, regimen E, a regimen testing trialos. Next slide. 
so at this time, uh, uh, 77 uh, people have been screened uh, for enrollment in trialos, and 48 have been assigned uh, to, um, you know, to active or placebo within their regimen. Next slide. And as of right now, we are enrolling at 37 sites. Since last week, a new site has been activated. That's Vanderbilt University. So congratulations to them. Next slide. And so you can always check the status of your of the site nearest you online. Uh, and as I mentioned in, in previous meetings, uh, all sites listed are active in at least uh, some regiments, but uh, if they are, uh, not everyone is active on regimen E. So not everyone is enrolling in regimen E yet. So if they are enrolling, they will be listed as recruiting, such as Lehigh Valley in, in the example here. Uh, and in that case, they are accepting new participants uh, for Regimen E. Now we are also working hard to activate the remaining sites for Regimen E. Next slide. And, and as always, uh, please contact uh, Catherine and Alison. And here you can also see a list of uh, future guest speakers. We really love to hear from, from multiple people and multiple perspectives. Next slide. And last but not least, tomorrow, actually, uh, time flies. So tomorrow we're going to have another webinar. So uh, please um, let your friends and, and uh, know that, you know, this, this webinar is happening tomorrow for every, anyone who may be interested in learning more about Regimen E, which is the fifth regimen that we are enrolling for in the platform trial. Uh, we're going to have a great discussion tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern, um, you know, so that people can learn more about the logistics um, of participating and also what, what the trial participation um, would entail. All right, great. I see uh, we can stop sharing the slides. Um, and I'm see maybe if, see a few comments uh, of gratitude to Bruce. Thank you, thank you so much. And I know you've been, you know, I know some people have some personal questions about your specific care, et cetera, perhaps they're best directed to you privately sure. uh, if there are questions about that. Um, your, the specifics of your treatment. Um, and, and then um, we had questions, other questions about Regimen E, when do we expect to be fully enrolled? Well, we are still monitoring that closely. Uh, there's a lot going on in ALS that I think may affect enrollment, like you know, the approval of new drugs this year, which is a good thing, uh, but we're uh, obviously um, hoping to, to enroll um, you know, over the next few months as we, as we activate all sites so that we can have results for regimen E soon as well. Good, I think that was, uh, there was a question, actually I'll, I'll ask Catherine or Alison if you know of any um, uh, organizations that offer counseling. Um, what type of? I think it's, um, yeah, family counseling. Um, I think I would refer people to IMALS. And they have a, a very good mentor program as well as social workers that are happy to speak with anybody who has a loved one on this journey. Thank you, that's a good idea. Um, also, there's a question about a link to the chapter about EAPs. And um, I don't know if it was put, um, oh yes, it's actually Allison in the chat. Allison popped that into the chat. Perfect, so Thank it's you, in the Allison. chat. Thank you. And you can always go on the Neil's website for more. Bruce, any final thoughts from you? Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, again, for those of you who are attending, if there's additional information that we can get to you about uh, how to get involved in clinical trials, how to get a family member involved in clinical trials, or EAPs, if you're um, in the group that just doesn't qualify for clinical trials. Uh, definitely reach out to Catherine or Allison if the question is for me. Through them, they can relay the question to me and I will definitely get back to you. Um, but you know, that's what it's all about is the more patients we have involved and their families we have involved. And you know, I know the strain that it is on caregivers, but you know, sometimes this can give a little bit of hope to caregivers as well. But the more of you that are involved, the more that we can learn about the science and hopefully the sooner that we can try to solve something with this disease. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for all the help that you continue to give us as, as a member of our committee. Uh, and people are also asking how to join our committees. Please feel free to um, volunteer via Catherine or Alison. And, and again, we, we all, always love to have input from patients and their families. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.